Okay. It's five o'clock. So, uh, hello, I'm Bill Dwight. I'm city councilor at large, and I'm also the chair of legislative matters. Uh, we will be convening this meeting of February 10th, 2020. In just a moment, but first, um, given that there's a lot of folks here, I'm going to explain what the process is. We have two hearings this evening. Um, I suspect most of you are here for the first. Uh, there is a second hearing also on uh, wireless antennas on street poles for 5G systems. And I suspect Council Murphy may be here for that. I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so the process is, this is a hearing to discuss um, uh, potential zoning ordinances or uh, zone ordinance modifications. One is the, the wireless towers is creating an ordinance. The, um, the ordinance to allow a change from one conforming use to another is a uh, modification of existing zoning. We will be discussing, when we deliberate here, we will be discussing the zoning as it applies as a law. I know that many of you hear about a specific project that has some relevance to this. Um, that doesn't preclude your testimony. Your testimony, you can say whatever you want and speak to whatever you want, but understand that when we deliberate, we'll be deliberating um, not specifically about your project. Um, it is also, there are three outcomes here, well, possibly four outcomes. Uh, one is a positive recommendation that would be forwarded to the council for consideration. That's if we if we vote the majority to recommend any of these. The other is a neutral vote, which is to say we say meh and send it on with an explanation. And then there's a negative vote, um, basically saying we don't approve of these uh, ordinances they stand. The other possibility is tabling for, for or extending the uh, public hearing if there is uh, if it's if we find that if the if the if the counselors who are seated here find that there is a need for more information or more deliberation and discussion then that is another possible motion so those are the those are the possibilities that play out so before I ask Laura to call the roll, I'm also going to give folks a heads up. There's an opportunity for public comment to start with, which is different from the hearing. Public comment, you can basically speak on any issue. Um, obviously, it would be in all of our best interest if it was an issue relevant to something we're discussing today. But that, I'm, that's basically a three-minute limited time that we wouldn't necessarily comment on. The hearing part is gets a little more expansive and back and forth. You can speak without a time limitation. My request is if you hear someone say something that you agree with, you can say amen or ditto when you come up as opposed to repeating it. Um, it's far more efficient if you can, if you have new information that you can provide or something that you can expand on, that would be helpful as well. Um, we're all right, let's, yeah, that's enough blah, blah, blah. We can talk more when we get, when we get into the meeting. Uh, first, I'm going to ask Laura to call the roll. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Sarah. Here. Councilor Mayori. Here. Councilor Thor. Here. Okay. We are all here. We are convened. Uh, I also should notice, notify everyone that we are being audio and visually recorded in, by the municipal camera, which we are hopeful is actually working. We're not confident. And then I see another camera there that I have no control over or for it. Um, so that's, that's informed consent. If you don't want to be seen on a camera, just recognize that, that there's nothing we can do about that. So first I'll call for uh, a motion to accept the minutes of January 13, 2020, the organizational meeting. There's a motion. Is there a second? I'll count. Any discussion on those minutes? Any questions? Okay. All those in favor of approval of the minutes, please say aye. 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 And there's no oppose, I can tell, or abstentions. All right. So now we come to the public hearings. This is uh, the notices were published on January 27, 2020, and February 3rd, 2020, for Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, Section 5. 
<coughs> and there are copies of the legal ads if you need to see those. First up, we have uh, item 19.173. This is an ordinance to allow, excuse me, I just realized I forgot the public comment section. I, <laughs> so, is there anyone who would like to speak in public comment? Sure. I'm a little confused. About okay, when sure, sure. It's, what, it's kind of a general statement, but it does pertain to things that are on the agenda. Whatever you feel most comfortable doing. Okay. Well, where do you want me to do that? Uh, if you could step up to the podium here, right here, and if you could just tell us your name and the town you live in, you don't need to give your address. Okay. My name is Christine Nolan. I live in Northampton. Okay. And I want to thank you all for serving our city. Your positions are really important to the residents of Northampton, and the decisions that you make alter lives for the better or for the worse. I'm speaking tonight or today in opposition to the relaxing of zoning laws that may negatively impact current residents while enhancing efforts of developers. Apparently, my understanding is the city wants to make building projects easier to accomplish in the name of infill and density, and that makes developers happy. But the city also has a responsibility to consider the good people who are neighbors to these development projects, residents who have been city dwellers and taxpayers for decades. We are here. Many of us are here, and some are not here. We've been here all along. You don't hear from us that often, we're not calling you, writing to you, making appointments, because in general, we have felt secure. We have felt safe that the city is watching out for us, the homeowners. And that feeling of safety, I'm sorry to say, is now eroding. I urge you not to relax these zoning laws. I want you, our public servants, to have our backs. And that's what the zoning laws do. I want you and the planning board and the zoning board to continue to weigh and evaluate carefully each and every building project that comes before you. No two are the same, no matter the size, nor will the impact be the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that, that does not disqualify you from speaking during the hearing. You should know as well. So. Um, uh, another thing is, he, when people speak, I please speak, direct your comments to the committee here, uh, as opposed to the audience. So the, because we're essentially the people who are going to be deliberating, so it'd be, it'd be more helpful if you can stop. Um, okay, so here we are, back into where I, <laughs> back to where we were, and this is 19.173, an ordinance to allow changes from one conforming use uh, to another. Excuse me, Bill, there is someone holding their hand up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Come on up. Hi there. My name is Mark Mogio. I live in Northampton as well. I just will make this short and sweet. I just want to uh, ask that the committee this evening uh, just really weigh in on your vote or not vote this evening uh, because this isn't an all or nothing uh, ordinance. There's, I have sent emails to each and every one of you earlier today and I'd like you to look at those emails closely. There are alternatives, there's some great alternatives on there that could uh, be a middle of the road uh, way to do this thing instead of just cutting out a lot of this ordinance specifically to do with parking, uh, to do with size of projects and whatnot. So please take some time, look over those emails if you haven't already and at least delay this thing you don't have to push it through we are not a timeline per se here let's take our time and let's do a good job and really think this through so that another ordinance doesn't get kind of messed up the way that this one has I mean it's not messed up but there's a little glitch in it we don't want more glitches in the future okay thank you thank you very much anyone else Okay, two false starts, here we go. Um, this was referred to the planning board and 
legislative matters back on November 21st of 2019. Uh, was a positive recommendation with amendments from the Planning Board uh, January 9th, 2020. Um, I'm going to read the as amended version, if I can get it to open. this analog thing here. This is uh, in the year 2019, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Planning and Sustainability <coughs> and an, or an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing code <coughs> ordinances for the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by changing Section 350-9.3, B1, and 2 be consistent with the other sections of 9.3. Be it ordained by the City of Northampton in Council Assembled as follows. Amend as shown. This existing language here that I'm going to read first and I'll, and I'll highlight the deletions and the modifications. So, Change, extension, or alteration of legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses, or lots. And that's the heading. Uh, the body is legally pre-existing non-conforming structures, uses or lots may be changed, extended, or altered as set forth below, except as noted in uh, subsection 350-9.2a above, if the use is not eligible under one subsection, proceed to the next subsection. B. A conforming use on a pre-existing non-conforming lot, a conforming use on such a lot may be ex uh, changed, extended, or altered. One, parenthetically, one as a right to the same, and then the addition is or different, conforming use in conforming structure which meets all the dimensional and density provisions of the current zoning except for, and now this is an addition, the pre-existing non-conforming dimensional elements, and then striking that are pre-existing non-conforming, such as lot size, frontage, or depth, and when the lot size, frontage, and depth requirements do not change. So that's struck. And then number two is struck entirely, but that existing language that is with a finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals when said change, extension, or alteration is to a uh, direct Conforming use with different, I'm sorry, I'm reading the strike throughs. Uh, uh, different conforming use which requires the same or less minimum lot size, a lot area, minimum lot width and frontage, minimum lot depth, setbacks, and parking than is required for the present use, and then parenthetically, and lot does not fully conform to the present zoning requirements for the proposed use. Close parentheses. And then, of course, the requirement would be to renumber subsequent subsections based on the deletions. There you have it. So, I'll accept a motion to open the hearing. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. We are adjourned. We are assembled. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're done. Thank God. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm trying to get back online at the same time. Um, so the process here is traditionally is to hear from proponents first, uh, then to hear from opponents and or people who just have a question. Again, direct the questions to us if they're uh, for uh, uh, our, our, our person representing the planning department, Carolyn Nish, uh, then please direct them to us first and then she will respond. Um, and then and then we have an opportunity to open up more before we uh, feel that we've exhausted the conversation. So first up, I, uh, proponents, I suppose that's you, Carolyn? I, yes, I mean, I'm prepared with a presentation to okay. explain the ordinance. And, okay, yeah. that would be helpful, thank okay. you. And due to some glitches, I'm going to do sign language with Laura to have her switch screens <laughs> when ready. Um, so the uh, modifications to 9.3 um, that I, I'd like to explain um, tonight all relate to zoning in general and a land use plan. So I want to start back up a little bit and just talk about the land use plan, why we have zoning, 
um, what those public processes were to get to the zoning that we have now and how we are continuing to modify those um, zoning regulations um, related to criteria for development and then how it relates to this specific change. So, um, about that, and also think about the cost of services that are being 
um, that are involved in how we grow and develop and change um, over the years in the community. Uh, this sustainable Northampton plan and any land use plan is a policy document um, that guides public and um, private actions. And on the public side, it, it guides um, city um, policies relative to actions each department takes, decision making processes, um, spending, um, infrastructure investments, transportation um, directives or, or investments. On the private side, there are land use regulations that get adopted um, as a tool to implement the plan and address and guide development both for the private sector as well as the public sector. Um, and um, the idea behind the plan is that your regulations really need to match up to the plan so that you have a tool that helps um, for implementation purposes. Um, so what is zoning? Um, zoning is a way to, um, is, a, is a land use tool um, that again uh, directs growth, but it's a way of dividing up the community um, into geographic areas where different uses and development layout is treated uniformly within those districts and you treat different districts differently throughout the city. Um, it dictates the types of uses, where they're allowed, how much, um, how those uses are connected. It might include things like parking, open space, location of structures, heights, um, lot sizes, landscaping, protection of sensitive areas, and many more um, issues. Um, we've not always had zoning. In um, 1926, Northampton had its first zoning ordinance adopted, and it was about the same time around the country that zoning was um, beginning to be implemented as a tool to direct their growth should go and how to separate uses that might not be um, complementary. And so if you can imagine, um, by 1926, Northampton had already built out quite extensively. We had you know, almost 200 years of development before that time. Um, and it was very rudimentary in 1926 when zoning was first adopted. It had very few um, criteria, not like we have today. Um, and all the way from 1926 to 1975, um, um, we continued to build as a community. And um, then in 1975, um, new changes in both state law and locally um, addressed zoning and how zoning could be adopted in communities around the Commonwealth. And it was much more detailed, and we sort of refer to it as modern zoning because it had many more um, elements than previously. And again, sort of another um, 50 years of development had um, come forward in Northampton, so um, not aligned necessarily with the new zoning that was adopted in 1975. At that time, nonconformities were also um, detailed in um, more specificity in terms of how you address all the development that had come before that time um, and uh, that don't meet the current standards um, in zoning. And, and that section related to nonconformities was really sort of a, a secondary way and in lieu of planning to create some kind of tool um, that was um, very blunt and rudimentary in itself as a way to control reuse of those properties that didn't um, in the absence of planning, it didn't comply with the new zoning that was adopted in 1975. Um, in 2008, after the Sustainable Northampton was adopted, um, there was a committee established um, over a two-year process to look at zoning changes to make sure we took the zoning that was already in place up until that point and have it um, more readily match what the policy documents and the plan were about and what the goals for the city were moving forward. Um, that committee um, was charged with um, looking at the very at a lot of details about how there may be some mismatch matches in the zoning, and to create clear rules for uh, moving forward in terms of development, um, remove impediments um, for projects that met the rules because the idea was to be very clear about how things could be developed. Um, and what we wanted as a community, and to ensure that um, it was consistent 
that we were consistently able to achieve those goals and, and establish a very clear standard so that everyone understood what, what um, we as a community were seeking. Um, in two, so on the heels of that, between 2011 and 2013, um, there was adoption of zoning amendments um, related to residential development in the city. Um, and um, those amendments were really meant to achieve greater sustainability in the way we function in the community um, in a way that was equitable to provide opportunities for a whole range of um, people who live in our community and address um, um, goals for protection of environmentally sensitive areas. Um, it was a very, um, as I said, it was a long deliberative process in coming up with these criteria, particularly as it relates to um, distinguishing between just site plan approvals and special permits. Um, and the goal was, again, to create very um, understandable, more understandable and clear language. Um, so we spoke, we haven't even finished all of the work that we started from 2011 to 2013 in terms of trying to match all of those um, goals and objectives with the zoning. Um, the section 9.3b2, which is in front of you, is sort of a relic of that um, pre-existing non-conforming structure that was set up in the state statute and also mirrored in our local zoning. Um, it's really inconsistent with the way that we have um, tried to be clear about development in that it um, basically says if you are non-conforming, if your parcel was built decades ago in a certain way, and even though you can meet all these criteria, you can't, you can't move forward if you don't comply, even though we've set up very specific criteria about how to get a project completed. Um, Again, coming off of um, sort of going back and thinking about where this um, hard stop was in terms of nonconformities and only allowing single family homes to be able to move forward if they were nonconforming is reflective of um, the zoning changes at the time in the 60s and 70s and moving forward that um, people felt that single family homes were, if um, we allowed those to move forward, that wouldn't cause any um, impact or problem. And even in the downtown areas, multifamily housing was discouraged through zoning. You can see it very clearly. And that's exactly what these, um, this language of 9.3 is about, is not allowing more density by using the um, provision about um, required parking as sort of a stand-in for saying we don't want more dense development. Um, so um, in drilling down to more specifics about Section 9, there are, Section 9 deals with non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. So it's not just this little subsection that's in front of you, but it addresses um, many more non-compliance or non-conformities in the zoning. And it's really remained substantially the same since the 1970s. Um, and it was established long before we had this specific criteria about how we as a community wanted to grow and develop. Um, you read the proposed text um, changes, so I, I don't think I'll go through that now. But um, the idea is, you know, we have, now we have requirements like open space and buffers, traffic um, mitigation requirements, tree replacement and tree protection, landscaping requirements and lighting, special permit criteria specifically for multifamily housing. Um, again, adopted in the more recent years um, and um, without going back and sort of addressing the old language from the 1970s about nonconformities. Um, and these criteria that I just mentioned that are in the zoning now in other sections um, were created through lots of planning, lots of thought, lots of time by lots of community members um, to really spell out what we want as a community. Um, go to the next slide. So, um, let's get the page. Um, so, there are... Um, 
there are several types of um, parcels that, again, in those older neighborhoods in Northampton that were built out before zoning even existed, that might have some element that then is prohibited, that this section 9.3 um, 2B prohibits from ever changing more than just um, for minor modifications to a single family home. Um, and so the idea is really to allow change on those older parcels. Um, so long as they continue to meet what those new standards are that were adopted by a city council relative to um, different types of housing, so two, three families, multifamily, um, those provisions would still potentially be applicable, meaning that you still need to meet your open space and your setbacks and your heights and your parking um, requirements in those um, districts. It's just it would allow you to continue to be non-conforming for depth or for frontage. Um, and as long as you met the other criteria, then you could move forward through the planning board process. Um, and finally, um, the, uh, just to reiterate, the purpose of the amendment um, is really to bring um, the zoning further, make it further consistent with um, the way we've been working. Um, since 2008 to match the plan goals, um, not have an effect on the other review processes that are already in place, but not duplicate those or create another impediment for reaching the goals that the city has established. Um, full compliance with all the other factors would still remain in place. And so I just sort of have a chart up there showing typically what the various scenarios might be if you have a project proposed. Every time an applicant comes in for a project, there's a review to determine whether or not it's non-conforming and whether that non-conformity will still allow it to move forward if it's by right or by the zoning board. Then there's a zoning board decision and it would circle back to finding a building permit. There are other projects um, that can go straight to building permit even if they're non-conforming. Um, and I went, I'll um, get into that in, in a second, but then the, then the third sort of review is there are many projects, anything over 2,000 square feet of new construction that's not for a single family home automatically try, uh, triggers planning board review in which the board is reviewing many of those elements that I just described in terms of um, that have been established in the zoning and then go to building permit. Um, I wanted to also um, I have a, a page up there, it's not part of the slideshow, but there's um, a section, there are many sections, subsections within 9.3 that already allow um, projects to move forward by right um, without a zoning board review if they're non-conforming and they meet um, certain criteria. Um, so this change of this sort that's in front of you tonight is also consistent internally within that chapter 9. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Now's the opportunity for comments. And again, I would ask uh, when you come up to speak, please identify yourself and tell us the town you live in or city, presumed city. Um, and uh, and any takers? Some like to testify. Okay. Are you saying proponents or opponents? This is this would be opponents or people who are neutral and just with questions. So you have your hand up first. Come on up. Okay. Thank you. I'm Nancy Denig. And I live in Northampton. That's, uh, I just wanted to um, weigh in with the um, uh, response to the very first caveat that Carolyn's presentation gave, saying we have other, you know, it doesn't change special permit criteria if this goes through, if it's if it's under six or under seven plus lots or something to that effect. I just, just want to say that we've been, as a neighborhood, that we're concerned in particular about a development that's proposed in Dewey Court, 
and we are aware there are other situations in, in the city that this concern, it would be coming up again and again and again. But in any event, we were looking at this project from the point of view of the special permit criteria, and I'd be comfortable um, with various things if I sensed that there was an awareness that there there's not meeting special permit criteria. I wrote a letter that summarized, uh, you know, all the criteria, every single one I addressed them in regard to this project, how it does not meet the criteria. And every single one was argued that, oh, well, it doesn't apply to that, or it doesn't mean this. Uh, and uh, so I'm not assured at all by the fact that um, special permit criteria are going to protect the quality and the character of our neighborhoods. And uh, that is one of the criteria, the character. And, but uh, we're not, that's not the subject today, but just saying that's, there needs to be several gates that go through before something makes sense to do. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm John McLaughlin. I'm an attorney. Live and work in Northampton, um, speaking in opposition to the proposed ordinance. I represent Mark Mojo, who uh, talked earlier, and Mark has the support of almost all of his neighbors uh, in Dewey Court. And now we've heard from uh, people from throughout the city who are also uh, neighbors who are in opposition to uh, proposed uh, uh, projects. And I want to make it clear, this isn't a, an issue of uh, property owners versus renters. Probably many of the people who are here tonight in opposition are themselves renters. It's not a question of property rights or uh, property values. It's a question of allowing developments into neighborhoods that's going to hurt everybody in the neighborhood, whether you rent or your own. Um, most of these issues come down to really um, issues pertaining to <coughs> development, um, flood, on street parking, which is already bad, or development that's going to cause traffic problems that are already bad, okay? And uh, that was the big issue uh, with Dewey Court. Now, um, I, I understand uh, Ms. Mish is talking about the plans and what they have and trying to move forward and bring everything together, but really we're here because I filed the lawsuit on Dewey Court, and that's why we're here. Um, I filed the lawsuit saying that uh, the developer received a finding which he should never have received, and now that uh, case is on stay, meaning sort of just being held in advance, or we see what we do with the law. Obviously, if we change the law, then we're going to lose the lawsuit. <laughs> um, so it does pertain to that one issue, um, and that's why we're here today. Um, Ms. Mish talked about how um, the finding statutes now were um, relics and blunt, and uh, they're old. Well, just so you know, they're like everybody else's. I mean, it's not like you've got something left over that, oh, we, we meant to change this. I mean, every city, every town, everyone around here has finding ordinances. You would be the only city without finding ordinances. You would be a strange anomaly. You would be a developer's heaven is what you would be here. Um, and all we're asking is to at least consider the fact that maybe some changes could be made to this ordinance. And the ordinance now basically requires two things. If you have a bad lot, okay, I'm going to call them bad lots. There are lots that are not good for you. Okay, there's good lots. They have the right size, the right area, the right frontage, and then you have bad lots. And bad lots can be worse. There's bad lots that are worse than others. The lot in Dewey Court has zero frontage and only has access to the road through the pavement into it because it's at the butt end of a dead end. You can figure that out. And other lots might have 99 feet and you need 100. But what the law that you propose now is just do away with findings altogether. Take everything out of the discretion of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Because right now what the Zoning Board of Appeals is supposed to do it's supposed to look at how somebody's been using a bad lot for years. That's grandfathered. They can continue to do that forever. And now they want to change it. They want to amend it and put something in there. Well, you're using a lot that you shouldn't be using in the first place. So the law has been that if you're going to change it, you can't make it worse for the neighborhood. It can't be substantially worse. It can be worse, but it can't be substantially worse for the neighbors. If you're going to use what is a not illegal lot, if you're going to use an illegal lot, you have to use it so that it doesn't hurt the neighbors, all right? And, and now, you're basically saying, well, 
Uh, but, excuse me, now it, it also says that it can't be more intensive once it's approved with the finding. I can understand that you want to take that, some of those elements out. I mean, so, and indeed, many towns don't have the rule that there has the substantial detriment rule and it can't be more intensive. Maybe you could say if it's not substantially more detrimental, but it requires a little bit more parking, okay. Maybe you would allow such a thing. And maybe you could even say, if you want to build a one, a two, a three family, or uh, in-law apartments, go ahead and do that without finding. But that's not what anyone did here. They didn't try to think outside the box. They, it's not innovative to simply say yes to every developer. I don't know if people think that that's forward thinking for the city's laws. We're just going to say yes all the time, because that's essentially what you're doing. You're not giving the Zoning Board of Appeals the power to look at each situation and decide, is this a good um, for a, you know, a huge apartment building or not? Uh, and the question, like, that's sort of what you would look at if it's a large complex. For uh, a special permit, they'd say, should we allow this or not here? Um, but with the finding, it's slightly different. You have more power with the finding. The government would have more power to protect the neighbors. They would say, I'm going to weigh this proposed use as to the old use. And that might be that the board would then say, no, this is substantially more detrimental. We're not going to allow this. And it doesn't work the same way with the uh, special permit. Also, this relates a lot, as I said, to parking. Okay? Right now, somebody comes in for um, a special permit. They're going to deal with parking based upon what are truly antiquated rules, which are the parking regulations. The parking regulations are, are geared towards apartments where there might be a four-bedroom apartment and there's probably a family in there. So maybe one, maybe two cars, but not four cars. The type of developments that are on the board now are really apartments within apartments. Each one of those bedrooms, like in Dewey Court, 30 bedrooms, is going to have a separate door that you can lock away from the, um, from the living quarters with its own bathroom. Those are going to be like little apartments that are rented separately. You're going to have 30 cars there. So when you look at the regulations that pertain to special permit, they're going to say, oh, you meet the regulations from the 1970s for parking, when in reality, it's the, the parking is much, much worse because each one of the bedrooms is a separate little apartment now. And that gets to the other issue with the, with the shared living space uh, as we have it now. With the shared living space as we have it now, um, it looks like the city and some of the developers are saying, look, they, they do this in Boston, they do this in Southie, they, they do it uh, in New York, they do it in Brooklyn. We build an apartment where people have to share a living room, share a kitchen, but they have their living spaces, and it works there, why can't we do it here? Well, the main difference is, why it works there and it won't work here is because here, like it or not, people are going to bring their cars. They don't in downtown Boston. <laughs> they don't in Southie. But they will here. They'll bring their own cars. So you can't just treat it as if we're going to play, uh, as if we're in South Boston when we're doing these developments for shared living, unless you also say, okay, if you're going to have a shared living space, you can't have a car. But I don't think that's feasible, or it might be feasible, if people want to really look into that. But as it is now, with this new law that you're proposing, somebody can come in on a horrible lot and build an entire apartment complex get the special permit based upon outdated parking regulations, and it will be ruinous to the neighborhood for on-street parking and ruinous for traffic. And there's no longer the ability for the zoning board to say, no, that doesn't work. That doesn't work here. You shouldn't do that. And like I said, the measurement is weighing against, weighing against the past use so that um, they would have more power than the, the, than the planning board would have on a special permit. Um, so, so really, I, what I'm getting to it is, I can understand you might want to take out some of the language in the, in the existing law, but there's no reason at all to take away the power of your own board, trust your own board, trust your zoning board to make decisions as to what instances the issue of finding and which ones not to. Now, you're... Talk about blunt. This is the true bluntness. It's just that, say, no more findings. You'd, you'd be an anomaly in the area, and um, it would set you up for people building 
developments in neighborhoods that hurt everybody. Renters, property owners, whoever, is it, whoever wants to park on that street, whoever wants to travel on that street in traffic is going to have a horrible problem. And there's no reason to do this. I don't think it's part of any big city plan. It's here because I brought the lawsuit. That's the only reason we're here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else wish to speak? Councilor Matt. Hello, June Nash, 18 Montview, North New York. Um, so, uh, there's a project in my ward, <laughs> and that, um, so, so first off, uh, part of why we're here is that when people don't like a development, they look for a lever to push on to, to stop the development. Over on North Street, we saw it around wetlands. And over here on Dewey Court, we're seeing it around this, um, this frontage issue. And that, uh, so that's why we're here. Um, the, um, but, so I, I, I want to be clear about something. So I was part of the Zoning Revision Committee, and we made, we worked with Carolyn, with the Planning Department, made recommendations to the Planning Board. Our zoning is super developer-friendly. If you follow whatever our guidelines are, you know, I, it, there's, there's ways to, you can develop, you know, a URC, a, uh, a project of four units or more by right. You have the, if you have the dimensional requirements and everything, boom, it goes right through. Um, for a project of seven or more, yes, there are some, some more checks and balances that you need to go to. But by and large, we, we, we work to make sure that the zoning was very uh, developer friendly so that um, the infill could happen. Um, but I will say this, the one theme that we really stuck through to throughout all of our uh, discussions was the idea of streetscape. Streetscape is what, you know, you, the, the model for URC is if you go over to Graves Avenue, walk down Graves Avenue and you'll see what the URC uh, uh, dimensional guidelines represent that there's that that the the buildings are close to the street. There's a sidewalk. There's a tree belt. There's trees. It's walkable, um, and that that's reflected through all of the, the different URs. Um, so, in this particular project. The reason we're here today, in my view, is that the, the guidelines that we worked very hard on for over two years, around seven or more, were not really adhered to through the planning process. That when I look at the plan that was presented, I don't see, I don't see granite sidewalk, uh, uh, curbs, I don't see sidewalks, I don't see a relationship between the structure in the street that all of that stuff that we worked hard on and previous counselors, all, you know, we, we had lots and lots of, we had a whole other ZRC that went through the seven or more process. And so thus, you have pe people pushing back and they found a lever, and that's why we're here today. Um, the, this, and, and therefore right now I'm, it makes sense to me to remove this check in the process. But it doesn't because we're here today. <laughs> because of the, 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 um, what, what I think was the misapplication of our zoning to start out with. Um, there's also, there's a complexity to all of this. Right now, I know I have a number of constituents in the room, and they're thinking about Dewey Court. And, that, and rightfully so. But the thing is this, is, this is a very complex issue, and it can affect numerous other developments around town. So one that came to mind is that just uh, a project just got approved a few weeks ago, a month or so ago, it has to do with St. John's. St. John's went to the ZBA and got a finding for a 10-foot setback for their proposed condominiums by, by um, O'Connell Development. 
For me, at the time, I'm sitting there, wow, this makes sense. It's a residential units, they're going in. So, first of all, it's zoned uh, central business, and usually with central business, it needs to be like a 30-foot setback. And I was like, you know what? It's residential, it's consistent with the URC um, uh, uh, setbacks. And, you know, I, I'm thinking I'm fine with it. But now what's dawning on me is like, hold it, it's central business. What if they want to make, you know, thorns too there? You know, we've already approved it. We're already talking about, well, you know, you can go from residential use to, you know, to retail. And suddenly those neighbors, you know, based on that finding, because it's, you know, now they're, if you're allowed to just switch uses, how, how are we going to stop that? Um, the other thing I, I just want to say is that, um, so I, I, I'm going to be very leery as we move forward on this about, you know, all of the ramifications across the city. Um, the, the last thing I want to say is Dewey Court did not need to go to the ZBA. All they had to do was create more streetscape. If they followed our zoning that we worked so hard on, if they extended the street, if, um, if they created sidewalks, if they created a cul-de-sac, they could have more than got their, their, their 50 feet, only 50 feet of frontage. Um, for that many units, yes, they'd have to create more frontage. You know, uh, probably, um, probably, you know, with a cul-de-sac and a roadway, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but you could, you could get 16 units in there. You could get the townhouses in there. And um, they didn't need to go this route. They could have done it by right. They could have bought the property. They could have done it just like a subdivision. And maybe they couldn't have, uh, you know, proposed the building that they have right now. But there was another way to do this. So, um, so anyway... I'm going to be very leery as we move forward. And the last thing, I'm going to ask that Alan explain in plain English B1 and B2. So the one we're amending and also the one we're eliminating. Just so I, I really understand, because when I'm reading that, I'm like looking at, you know, the, the, the inside of the Monopoly board box and we've <laughs> crossed out some lines. And so, anyway. So thank you. Thank you. Um, how would you like to proceed? Would you like to respond to that now? Or um, I think that um, Carolyn is here to explain these changes. I mean, these are not legal issues. There's there's zoning changes and there are policy issues. Um, as I as I understood the zoning uh, or the uh, the finding requirements on B one. Obviously, prior to this proposal, or presently existing, a chain from one conforming use to another conforming use that requires additional elements, such as we're talking about parking here, uh, was not possible in the city of Northampton under the under existing zoning, which is something that the law really affords because the the real estate we have is the whole real estate we're ever going to have, and so. Real estate is treated differently in the law than other forms of property. Because we can make more widgets. We're not making any more real estate. And so uh, the idea that, uh, for instance, that, that uh, real estate can't be conveyed for long periods of time has been struck down by the court uh, under the rule, well, the rule against perpetuities in Massachusetts 30 years. Um, and so similarly, uh, <coughs> uses that can never be changed are disfavored because times change and we need to be able to change uses. And so what's being proposed is uh, allowing changes from one conforming use to another conforming use so long as that second conforming use, uh, most likely the more intensive use, conforms to the requirements applicable to it other than the element that was already deficient. Using Dewey Court, the element that was deficient was frontage. The proposal, as I understand it, 
met all of the requirements for that number of units other than the frontage, which was already non-conforming. This proposal would not be creating any new non-conformities, and that's what we're getting, that's what is being addressed by the proposed change. And um, I think that when Carolyn was talking about the special permit, um, the, the, uh, the import of that is that a finding requirement is the least stringent review of any review in, in the ordinance. So if there's a special permit, all of the issues around um, uh, being compatible with the neighborhood, not being detrimental to the neighborhood, are all subsumed in the special permit criteria. And that's a much more detailed and exacting look at the proposed use. This is a really cursory use. The finding is a very cursory use. You define the neighborhood, you define what the use is now, what the use is going to be, and determine whether it's substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Well, that's a, that, that's a, a very relaxed standard to begin with, because it recognizes that it can be seriously detrimental so as long as it's not substantially more detrimental, uh, whatever that standard means, but it's certainly less exacting and less arduous than the standards applied to a special permit. So the idea here is if you're going through a special permit anyway, uh, and, and the planning board is going to be uh, applying that more exacting standard, uh, why go through a finding which is a less exacting standard? And, and the spe special permits can certainly be used to deny a project. Anyone else wish to speak? Oh, Amy. Um, hi, my name is Ruth Von Bowler, and I'm a Northampton resident. Sorry. Okay. And um, I'm very new to this topic. I have not had a t paid time to pr put together a. PowerPoint or even think through the issues and I don't even know exactly where I stand on it yet. And um, so I guess I'm here to say, um, to ask you to take your time in making a decision, to not rush into this. Let us try and figure out the pros and cons. I'm hearing a lot about um, it, 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 it being a balance between wanting to make things easier for our developers but on the other side, wanting to protect our residents. And so um, rather than rushing into a decision, I ask that you give us, us and yourselves, I don't know if you are all up to speed, but give everybody a little time to think about this before we rush into it. I don't know, you know, it, it sounds like there's a lot of different um, zoning board issues that are still under um, being finessed and why this one has to kind of bubble up right now and be expedited, I don't, I don't quite, understand other than I know that there's some pressing projects so I, I just ask that you know you give this um, enough time to give this project it, it's an important zoning change um, that gives residents a little bit additional protection and I ask you that if you just give it enough time for everybody to think through so thank you thank you Willie. I'm going to try not to do the thing that everyone else has done when they come up here, which is bang this door and have it fly back around. <laughs> <laughs> Can someone get that fixed? It's just a key. It's a key. Wow. Here we go. Oh, goodness. It's like the on off switch. Um, Lily Lombard, I live in Northampton. I want to build off of what Ruth said, and I want to hearken to an example of um, a, an ordinance where there was a perceived need to rush it through, which was the uh, the ordinance pertaining to large-scale ground-mounted solar arrays because there was a loophole in that law too and yet when it came before legislative matters this is um, maybe about a year ago it really wasn't quite cooked it wasn't quite there and thanks to um, Councillor Murphy who's in the room and uh, Councillor Klein who made a motion to continue um, it, hearing that while parties got together and discussed some of the ways that this ordinance could be tweaked. Now I've heard from the, uh, the land use attorney behind me that there are some other options we can consider. We certainly need to um, make it so that it's um, not impossible for non-conforming lots to ever be developed. Um, so there's that intensity issue that seems to need to be lifted. 
But um, I, I do worry that when I hear from him as someone who has a lot of familiarity with um, development and the way development is perceived and, and, and regulated in other communities that we're very liberal, and then that's confirmed by Councillor Nash too, that we're very development friendly, um, I want us to pause. And just take our time. And if there are, I, I know that um, Mark Mojo sent some options for you to consider, um, other than just an up or down on this um, ordinance. Take the time to consider them. You know, there are two counselors on this committee. That's 50% of you who are brand new to this, and probably brand new to zoning and planning for the most part. It's a really complicated subject. I'm on a steep learning curve myself. So um, I would uh, urge you to continue this and explore some of the options. I don't hear any proponents in this room other than the city. And um, you have a lot of neighbors who are concerned about a floodgate opening. So I, um, I would like to urge that. The other thing that I want to point out is that I agree that we did go through a community process where we discussed you know, how we wanted uh, our uh, our settlements, our human settlements to occur in our city and we wanted to try to cluster them closer in and encourage walking and biking and um, shared services and all that great stuff. But you know, um, we have to keep evolving and we have to keep learning. And I take the perspective as uh, someone on the Public Shade Tree Commission who is studying the decline of our canopy, our tree canopy over time. And I'm also following the scientific research nationally, internationally, about how critical a tree canopy is to mitigating and building resilience around climate change in the coming years. And that goes for downtown. That, we're not just talking about preserving our forests. Those are really important to do too, but I'm talking about trees in downtown. And one of the things that got me very engaged in this project is that it puts, uh, at the minimum, uh, five and probably closer to 11 significant trees, which, by the way, we define as much larger than pretty much any other community defines a significant tree, at risk. And so I, I am asking myself, given what I'm learning about the value of ur our urban shade tree canopy, and um, given how um, liberal we seem to be about promoting development and uh, uh, making it not that, uh, not, making the disincentive, the, incentive, uh, the disincentive not that great for removing trees, I, I think that we need to keep evolving um, as a community about what infill looks like. And so um, I, I know that doesn't pertain to your subcommittee so you know, narrowly. Uh, that's a larger issue. But what I'm saying is I don't think the community conversation is over. I think we need to keep talking about what it means to have a you know, climate-friendly, um, affordable, equitable, uh, safe community in an era of rapid climate change. And so that's... Um, all this to say, let's let's get it right. Let's not let's not rush this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sure. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Kate Barak. I live in Northampton, and I just want to echo what Lily has said, what Ruth has said. Um, my concern, from what I've heard tonight, is that this ordinance change would be just a yes or no type of thing. Oh, we don't like what we have, let's just open it up. And that is a very scary uh, scenario to me. I think um, it deserves more discussion, it deserves more input from our community, and um, I echo everyone who said, let's pause, let's do this right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next. My name is Farnsworth Bobenstein, and I'm a very happy resident of Northampton. We downsized from Amherst last summer. In the planning board, Carolyn Mish acknowledged that there are hundreds and hundreds of pre-existing non-conforming lots. That means every ward in this city. That means lots everywhere. 
I believe that we need more time to carefully consider if there are hundreds and hundreds of pre-existing non-conforming lots, does this proposal, which already had to be modified because it wasn't written well the first time, really meet the needs of this city with hundreds and hundreds of pre-existing non-conforming lots and how do we examine that? So I am also suggesting that given these complexities, you have the freedom to consider additional options of gathering more information. And that would be in your best interest, I believe, and in our best interest. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Yes. Hi, my name is Elaine Jundu, and I live in Northampton, and I'm just echoing the fact and zeroing the fact that I believe that there's all of the answers, there's a lot of questions. Nobody feels comfortable about the new ordinance that you're proposing, and I just wish and request that you give a little bit more time for this proposal, the new ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Lawrence with Lobenstein again. We discussed some proposals that I don't think Attorney McLaughlin presented clearly enough, which is that you could choose to say three or fewer units like single-family houses don't need a finding, we don't need to go to the CBA. That six or fewer units could be treated differently than seven or more. But our concern is that the zoning board still be required to review projects that are seven or more. And that's a way that changing this zoning ordinance would better protect communities, neighborhoods, and the town as a whole. Thank you. Yes. Nancy Demick from Northampton. Just wanted to say the way the Dewey Court proposal has been, uh, project, proposed project has been conveyed here is that this is our Hail Mary, you know, this one thing is, is the technicality that we're going to to pre prevent a proposal to go forward, which is far from the case. And as I spoke at the very beginning, there are so many special criteria that should be applied to this project. Um, and just to be particular, 75% um, of the building is within a wetland buffer zone. Um, Major trees are being removed in this, not just um, at risk. Uh, and also, um, thinking about streetscape, instead of uh, what would be required uh, in an ideal streetscape, uh, parking garages or um, what are they called, carports, um, are backing up against uh, abutters and not on the road itself at all. So, my view as an abutter, would be looking at the back of the carport. And, and so, and also the character of the building, I mean, there, every single criterion is not met. And just this one thing is, is not just one little glitch for us, it's one of a whole series of other issues we have with this proposal. But. Mark Mojo from Northampton again. I, I wanted to just hit on the special permitting process. Obviously, there's glitches with that process as well. And that's what brought us here, because we weren't happy with the way that that process went. And because we got that finding, we were able to, or because that finding was passed, we were able to stop this project as it is now. But if, if this the special permitting process isn't a, a, a great Thing. There's a lot of glitches in that, and obviously it's all subject to the planning board. They can 
see that they like things or not like things. So it, it's, and in, in honestly, the, uh, they have recommendations from Carolyn and Wayne. Uh, and I, they're a volunteer board. They aren't necessarily educated on all these different criteria. Uh, hopefully they are, but they're volunteers. I get it. Uh, it's not their expertise. So they do take recommendations from Carolyn and Wayne into consideration, and that weighs heavy on their decisions. So special permits, uh, the criteria, the seven steps, have a lot of flaws in them, or at least they aren't always followed by the planning board from what we have seen so far. Anyone else? Okay, uh, Carolyn, do you want to respond to some of the things that you heard, or? Um, sure. Um, I think I. I I think it's important to talk about parking because that's an issue that comes up with any project. Um, and that's an element here that's sort of taken out of, um, is being considered to be removed. We actually have done extensive work on changing the parking requirements from uh, over time and most recently in the last three or four years. Um, so that has been evaluated. We also, in um, we know we've done looked at the data for car ownership, and the car ownership in downtown is much less than for the outlying areas um, beyond URB. So um, that's taken into consideration in terms of our parking um, calculation and parking requirements. Um, I think the uh, the other um, the other piece to think about there was um, a reference to potentially allowing. Um, development to move forward with a finding instead of by right. Um, again, we have um, probably six subsections in 9.3 that allow non-conforming lots to move forward um, by right. I would say, though, that um, by adding another layer of review that's a finding that's not nearly as um, as detailed a review as required for, as the planning board looks at, um, is really just adding another permit without maybe adding value to that other additional permit that would be in place. And so it seems to me if you're thinking about a finding, it would be for those projects that would want to be, um, that are proposed for changing to a new conforming use, but that don't trigger any other permit review. So if it doesn't require another planning board permit, then that would be the reason to go to the zoning board in sort of either or scenario. Um, so that's um, something uh, potentially to consider. Um, it's not, it's definitely, there's been a lot of conversation in the city about creating new impervious surface and creating parking that's not, parking spaces that are not used. I would, there's a piece of that, um, someone mentioned, um, I believe it was Mark Mojo mentioned that um, we should be looking at our parking um, uh, requirements. That's not part of this amendment, except for the fact that we have this um, phrase in there about um, um, that if something triggers more parking, that it, it's not allowed. Um, but I so I would caution any evaluation of, of requiring more parking in areas that we know are not um, where we have fewer cars owned by people. Um, but I don't know if you had specific questions about comments, or maybe happy to answer them. Well, um, I think yes, ma'am. Uh, I just had a question about the findings. Is that a public meeting? Is that another place where yes, public could have input? Yes, that's a public. So meeting. even though it's an easier, perhaps an easier process, it is a chance, another chance for the public to weigh in, right? Okay. Um, and I guess just on another note, in comparison to other communities and how. It was stated that we're developer friendly. The goal for the city has been to say, we want development, but we want development our way. And if you do development the way we've said it, then yes, you're going to get your permit, as opposed to many, many other communities that just have a blanket or generic statement about what's allowed, or either this is special permit or not. But it's not, nobody knows going in how they get their special permit. So I wouldn't necessarily say, I would say it's developer friendly on purpose 
but we are very specific about the criteria we want. And some applicants don't want to do that. They want to take their chances in other communities that haven't gone through that thought process and haven't established very specific criteria um, and do sort of fall back on very generic language to um, prevent development and then nobody understands what those rules are to play on. Any other uh, comments or any other testimony? Yes, sir. My name is Scott Reinhardt. I'm here from Northampton. And I was listening to all of these things. Uh, parking kept coming up with Carolyn. And the attorney over here was saying it was only a matter of frontage. But one of the things that did keep coming up was we have a mechanism in place to allow this to be taken out earlier. And that is the zoning board of appeals. And when this, I live on Dewey Court, and when that process started, in 350, uh, Section 10, Paragraph 2, gives you five, uh, seven criteria that must be met. Seven, five out of the seven were not met, including parking, traffic, all these sort of things, impact on the neighborhood. When we asked, could they slow that down and review those processes, that was a very contentious long meeting. It just went right <coughs> ahead. So to say we have all of these things in place and it's very clear what we can do when we go in the file, if you have it spelled out that you must meet these seven right requirements, and then you say, oh, well, five of them don't count. That's really not very clear. Okay, we'd asked for a traffic study. It was voted down. They're talking about putting a huge building at the end of my street, 32 units. That's more bedroom units than currently exist in the neighborhood. We were talking about traffic at the end of the street, South Street and South Street and Dewey Court, the horrible place. The zoning board guy said, oh, that intersection's already got an F. What's going to happen if it goes to an F minus? Not far down the street, somebody was killed a few years ago. A couple of weeks ago, there was a meeting in here, a very crowded meeting, saying one death is too many. We need to deal with traffic. But yet, when we come in here in these venues, we don't want to deal with traffic. We don't want to get a parking study. We don't want to get any of these things because it's inconvenient. My neighbors and I are not against development. We'd love to see some responsible end build. But a three-story, 32-bedroom unit is not responsible for that neighborhood. And that's what we ask, is that people just slow down and look at the whole picture instead of parsing, oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry if I get uh, a little animated about this, but one of your criteria that falls under ADA guidelines is that you cannot put a development that is impactful to people with disabilities. There are several people in that immediate neighborhood, myself included, who are legally blind. It was brought up to the board's attention that that needs to be addressed, and we were pushed off and said, that's not, we can't do that. So it's the middle of the winter, why can't we get a traffic study? If you're putting 32 bedroom units, why can't you see what the traffic, the, they, the traffic <coughs> study that they, excuse me, that they used was antiquated and it was somewhat erroneous because they were going by the dock at the end of the street. And they said, oh, that's going to be 15 office visits a day. Well, at his peak, which was a long time ago, he said he had four office visits a day. It was never used in that way. So again, even if you go with that previous thing, we keep jumping outside of it. And so, before we put this huge monstrosity up there that we cannot go back, uh, I think maybe just a little bit of tapping the brakes and seeing, you know, what really is happening rather than changing, I, you know, I think would be even worse. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> 
the Madden Northampton. Um, I just want to offer another perspective to Carolyn's. I know that she said there's been a lot of research into parking in the area. I'm a 30-year-old professional. I work in Westfield. I live in Northampton. All of my friends, also 30-year-old professionals. We live in the area. We support the community. None of us can afford to rent our own property. We all rent with multiple people. We all have apartments that we share. We are sort of what's moving into the community, and we all have cars because it's not feasible yet to live in this community without one. So we're all living with cars. A lot of us have limited parking. I have friends who live in Live 155, another similar project <coughs> to this, that also doesn't have parking. And they spend on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they can't find parking anywhere close to where they live. So when they're coming home, they're paramedics, EMTs, work in emergency services, they often have to spend 30 to 45 minutes finding parking getting back to their apartment. And that's a super recent development in Northampton that has issues that I feel like fall under this bracket. So, thank you. Thank you. I could speak a more Mr. Chairman. Councilman Ash talked about the streetscape provisions. Um, and that is something that the city spent a lot of time developing. The idea is that uh, when you're going to build in Northampton new projects, they want them to be pedestrian friendly. They want it to have the buildings right near the street and that it integrates with the pedestrian aspect of the lifestyle of the city. Um, with certain lots that are non conforming lots, that's impossible. This, the, this, the lot of Dewey Court, what they built, because they can't build it on the streetscape, even though they're supposed to. Instead, what they propose is a big residential uh, like box with a sea of pavement in front of it. It's kind of like of the Walmart for residential life, you know. And when you're, if you could craft some type of ordinance that could find uh, issues that work with a finding, you could do something much better than simply saying we're getting rid of findings. You could work into uh, the, the, the ordinance provisions that whether Maybe there's findings for stuff that won't work with the uh, cityscape or streetscape. You could do something more. You could do something more than just say yay or nay. And uh, but take into account that some lots are worse than others. So, but this provision doesn't take that into account at all. But the zoning board of appeals could take it into account that some lots are really bad, non-conforming lots, and some aren't as bad. But if you just say developers build all you want, whatever you want, you won't give the zoning board the chance to try to craft something good. You could craft something good with an ordinance that works and that makes more people happy instead of what we have here today. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, just checking. Um, in the absence of further testimony, um, for the new councilors, uh, what we would do at this point is consider closing the public hearing. And then later in the agenda, we will deliberate on this. Um, the public will be able to uh, hear that and to some extent participate. I want to be careful there because it's mostly our deliberations at this point. I also want to reiterate, um, while there is great relevance to the descriptions that we've heard exclusively from Dewey Court, as far as I can tell at this point. It is not no, 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 no. I take it back. I'm sorry. With referencing Dewey Court, how's that? That you feel we're comfortable with that? Um, the fact is that we are talking about not Dewey Court, but Dewey Court is a point of reference and a case in point. So it's not, we're not ignoring it, but at the same time, we, in this ordinance that's being discussed, there's no issue, uh, we don't codify parking. We don't codify the, the uh, various uses that some of you express concern with. So um, that's just a caveat there for me as we proceed into this. Is there a motion to close the public hearing? Can close the public hearing? Councilor Dwight, so if we do close this public hearing, we will not be able to hear it. Not on this. Not on this. 
with all due respect, what I'm hearing today and uh, gathering from the comments, I would uh, respectfully move to table this for appropriate. Okay. That's to actually continue. I'll continue. The vote. Sorry, thank you. Continue the vote. I would second that. So the motion is to continue the public hearing. Um, we actually, okay. <laughs> we could continue it in situ. We can continue the conversation now, or we can um, put this on the agenda for our next meeting for the continuance. <coughs> is that your, what's your plan? I do have some questions, but I'd still like to uh, continue this for. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can still ask questions in the context of the public hearing. They're not preempted from asking questions on that. So um, it's just a question of deliberating at that point. So the, um, if there's information that you still need and you want to seek out, either in here or outside, in then. Well, caution against um, using evidence taken outside the public hearing. Exactly. So let's, if there's evidence, <laughs> At this point, the question is, is there more relevant and, um, relevant evidence or facts that you need in order to discuss this yes. with your fellow committee members? Uh, if the answer to that is yes, then it's totally appropriate to continue the hearing so that you can take more testimony and gather more evidence in the hearing. But if all you have is questions about how this is going to operate or or questioning um, how best to address this uh, without taking in more facts, then that's part of the deliberation. I would like, I would like to have more questions. Okay, so the, the motion is to continue the hearing to our next uh, meeting, which will be March 1. Second. It'll be in March. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Okay, so March 9th in these chambers at 5 o'clock. Same thing. So that's the motion here. We haven't voted on it yet. Hang on a second. You're with us. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Councilor Sharon. Um, can I ask Councilor Thorpe, um, what information do you need and how can we get it at the next? Meeting. So, are there people you should invite to be there? Because, as we, as, as, um, Mr. Seawalt said, you know, so we're it's information we're gathering within the hearing, not outside of the hearing. So, either would you like to ask more questions now with the people here, or are there people you want to invite at the next meeting? I'd like to ask a couple, a few more questions if I could of uh, Carol Nish. And sure. I think at the hearing, I would like to. Uh, Hear more from Carolyn Nash, and also I don't believe I'd like to take a look. Maybe it's here. There's a future land use map. I'd like to take a look at. It. Is there sure. a slide? Yeah. So I can. Um, I think it's the second or third um, slide. Um, okay. Well, there was a motion on the floor. <laughs> so um, I think rather than the limbo, that it's appropriate for to meet with Carolyn and, and discuss it. Um, Council Mayor, said the same applies with us. Anyone wants to have uh, conversations with them. The public, of course, is welcome to provide any further testimony or anything, or ask questions um, to any of us. But, uh, with, the, <laughs> with the caveat, and this, is, this has been difficult for us, because, of the, because there was a suit, we had to be very constrained about how we dealt with this and would continue to deal with this. Also, the concern is for open meeting law by um, We, all our deliberation has to take place before you and in the public. It can't take place if there's three of us at a meeting or any more than two of us talking or even emailing about this serially is a violation of the Massachusetts Open Meeting Law. And we also want to be very careful that we don't jeopardize anyone's case in the instance of a potential suit. So you're welcome to reach out to us and speak with us, and we can speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. In fact, we're not precluded 
by law from speaking to anyone, but we just, we're just doing it with an excess of caution. Uh, we're erring on the side of caution. Uh, Mr. Chair, you are sitting in a quasi-judicial role. You should not be gathering evidence outside of these walls. Every, if you want more evidence, bring it here so everyone knows what's being said to you, what you're basing your decisions on, and that, that uh, conversation. And, and what qualifies as evidence then? Testimony from the public and also uh, conversations with uh, uh, Carolyn? It's, it's, Carolyn should bring, if you have questions for Carolyn, she should answer them should be here. on the floor. Fair enough. So, um, if I would ask uh, Council Thorpe to at least if you could iterate your questions, share them with uh, Carolyn so that she may answer them here in, in the public space. Does that work? That's fine. You can solicit the information from her, but you'd have to present it here. Thank you. Okay. Can you clarify how we can engage with our counselors on yes. this, including those those who happen to represent us, all of you represent me, who are also sitting on this committee? You're, you're engaging in that. No, I'm talking about outside of this room. Not when they're sitting as quasi-judicial officers and making I, a, a decision in a public hearing. Um, you should not be taking evidence outside the public hearing. Because you, as citizens, have the right to know what these committee members are basing their decision on. And if they're out talking to people and getting evidence outside of this hearing, you have no idea what they're basing their decision so on. So, when, Alan, you remember when we worked on the solar array, the, you know, brown mounted... That, that public hearing, which went before Legislative Matters, was, was continued, during which time I talked to counselors, I talked to Carolyn, and you were there at, around this table not cautioning me against that. Well, I would, nobody was suggesting going out and, and gathering evidence. I didn't hear, and if I missed it, I apologize, but I didn't hear the committee members saying they were gonna, they, that they were going to out into the public to gather evidence. And if that's the case, that's not appropriate for a quasi-judicial officer. But you should be taking that evidence in the hearing. So, and this is for your benefit. This isn't for their benefit. It's for your benefit because you don't want them making decisions based on information they heard outside this hearing and then you don't know about and you didn't get an, an opportunity to address. And that's what that's the caution here. Now, but, but, but sh I, sure. I, excuse me, hang on a second. You need to be recognized. And Thank also, you. the other issue is that we have a motion on the floor here exactly. that we have to address. We are actually deliberating now, and, and so I want to speak to that motion. Uh, and then we can, we can have conversations about the other things that actually uh, come outside of this at this point. So the motion is it stands. It's currently to. Uh, uh, continue the hearing till our next meeting at 5 o'clock. Any other discussions on that point? That's where we're going. On that point? Yeah. On the continuation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this will be a voice vote. All those in favor of uh, continuing the, the hearing, keep it open, keeping it open till uh, our meeting on March 9th at 5 p.m. I'll say aye. 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 Okay. Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> Got through that motion. Um, we actually have another hearing schedule. Um, so you know the, the tricky and dicey parameters, maybe you have some sense of how this is playing out. Um, it, and I think part of the problem comes from the fact that there is a specific direct and immediate concern about a, about a pending or suspended project and the local, larger overall arching discussion, which is what we're supposed to be having. Um, and I know that a number of you have reached out to me and uh, to all of us, I'm pretty sure. I don't know that for a fact, I will state, <laughs> because I don't, I have not discussed this with other counselors, but that, um, you know, you're welcome to send me emails describing your concerns and what you feel is important, and that holds true for these counselors as well. They will be part of the public record, just so you know, so if you want to cuss us out, just remember that's per perpetuity, that's for, but that's the permanent record. So to that extent, that's where we stand right now. Um, so 
on to the next item, and you're all welcome to stay for this. This is um, an ordinance related to the wireless antennas on street poles. This is uh, 5G network antenna systems that will be placed in the uh, This is Thank you. Thank you. We'll wait until the Please be mindful that we're still, we're still playing the video. So. Hey, the force is moving. Oh, I know. Look, but I'm just saying that the force be with you. Thank you for your time. I know you guys don't, uh, you're not elected and everything else, but I appreciate your effort. Well, unfortunately, we are elected. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. <laughs> short straw. Next up, item 19.125 is an ordinance related to wireless events on street poles. This is how we accept the motion to open the public hearing. Second. Okay, all those in favor of open the public hearing, please say aye. Aye. So this was referred to legislative matters in the planning board back in September 5th, 2019. It also had a public hearing was held with a positive recommendation from the planning board on September 26, 2019. Another public hearing with a positive recommendation <coughs> with a stipulation that the amended language be provided by the Office of Planning and Sustainability to address concerns about placement of equipment on the poles, and that was uh, back on October 7th. And it was amended by the council to strike uh, the word 5G from the phrase, quote, for the purpose of providing 5G telecommunications, close quote, and then refer back to legislative matters for further discussion back on October 17, 2019. It was continued to December 9, 2019, and then we find ourselves today because it's a carryover uh, by our rules. So the proposed amendments were submitted by the Office of Planning and Sustainability to address concerns about the mounting height of antennas on the poles and the projection of equipment beyond the curb, but these amendments have not yet been accepted. So, I'm going to read what we got so far. Well, actually, right, here it is. Here it is. This is the newest version, right? Yes. Okay. Blue and red and black. Um, Okay, I'm going to skip all the blotty blah in the front where we identify the fact that we're in Northampton. So we're going to go. This is uh, subsection 285-53, uh, small cell communication antennas on street poles with an addition of or within the uh, city rights of way. Um, a, it is a city policy to embrace wireless small cell, and then we strike telecommunications and replace that with facilities to improve telecommunications and add and wireless service for all users while minimizing the adverse impacts and covering city monitoring and administration costs. B, wireless and all other telecommunication antennas are regulated by zoning, section 350-10.9. Telecommunications, personal wireless facilities, and small telecommunic uh, small cell telecommunications. C. Each wireless small cell and then strike telecommunications. Each so it would read each wireless small cell antennas uh, pluralized on public ways and strike or public land. And then parenthetically, including those already installed. Close parentheses shall pay an annual strike $400 to and amended to $270 for right-of-way access and inspections. Also adding, each such facility that is located within a traffic signal pole or light pole on public land shall pay a fee of $1,000 annually to offset additional maintenance and inspections necessary on these multi-function poles. In parentheses, fees shall be waived if the wireless telecommunications provider provides free community or city Wi-Fi services in accordance with service agreements signed by the mayor. Most parentheses. Adding in 
D, the telecommunications providers shall be solely responsible for equipment and safety, for moving equipment at no cost to the city when required for any city construction project, and they're also adding, and must respond within 10 calendar days of notice, and for ensuring there is no impediment to pedestrian or traffic flow, also adding failure to meet these time limits shall result in a doubling of annual fees for the following year. E, the provider, this is all new, the provider shall indemnify and hold the city harmless from all loss or damage to persons, property related to injury arising from the construction, maintenance, use, repair of the wireless infrastructure, and from any loss or damages that results from the facilities including shedding of ice or debris. And then F, the provider shall restore any damage to the rights of way stemming from installation, maintenance, or repair of the related infrastructures, including damage to the public shade trees, sidewalks, curbs, There it is. Wait, there's more. Let's <laughs> oh God. All right, I'm sorry. Now how much would you pay? All right, um, small cell, uh, Salt, small cell strike telecommunications and facilities, also known as small cells, are wireless telecommunications antennas and equipment that are mounted on structures less than 50 feet tall, including their antennas, or are not more than 10% taller than the adjacent structures with antennas of less than 3 cubic feet in volume. And with wireless equipment associated with the, uh, with the structure, including the wireless equipment, associated with the antenna and any pre-existing associated equipment on the structure that is no more than 2,800 feet in volume for the purpose of providing 5G wireless telecommunications. <laughs> huh. I thought we struck that. Yeah, okay. Consistent with Federal Communication uh, Commission regulations, standards and orders for small cells, including no RF, that is radio frequency, uh, in excess of FCC rules. Small cells are distinct from satellite antennas everywhere defined in this section. And then, uh, subsection 350-10.9 by adding a new subsection as follows, D, small cell telecommunications striking, and by adding subsections one and three, they're under inclusive. We now just have really subsection one, an application for approval of wireless small cell facilities shall be granted by the Department of Public Works in consultation with the Office of Planning and Sustainability in the Department of Central Services if it meets the requirements set forth in subsection 350-2.1 and meets the regulations to be promulgated by the Department of Public Works within 60 days of adoption of this ordinance and delete the rest from the ordinance. Can I just clarify, so this is not the version, the formerly before you is the one as it was referred by the city council, and this is a new version being this presented is a new version for consideration this is, today. Yes. So if you were going to act on this, it would be necessary to amend the one formerly before you to adopt these changes. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, yeah. Oh, I wasn't. I, no, 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 no. Um, actually, since, since we have it on the floor, and in fact, in the version that Carolyn just is proposing amendments. Carolyn, would you come and speak to what we moved to this point and, yeah. and explain the changes and stuff? Yes, so uh, this went to the, all the way to the floor of council and there was some discussion about uh, modifications that was referred back to legislative matter. Um, and the idea was we wanted to be more specific about the um, about the criteria for approval because the um, because the city doesn't um, have the ability just to deny these projects, it would become a staff approval. We talked a lot about that in the fall. Um, that instead of the way it is now, a special permit for um, these are private cell new cell towers. Um, this would set up the um, established criteria for. Um, projects that are within the right of way for the most part um, in the right of way um, but very specific about design criteria and size and scale and that kind of thing so that it would be 
um, the administrative approval process would, again, be um, apparent to anybody coming forward and they'd know they'd get a permit if they follow these guidelines. So um, we did, at the staff level, did some more research about the different types of antennas, the different ways they can be concealed, the way they're being installed in other cities around the country and what those design criteria are, um, and pulled a lot from those other communities that already have 5G, <laughs> um, and um, then went back to Department of Public Works to see how they felt about the, the expanded, now expanded text, which is much more detailed than what um, was previously submitted. There's also a question, um, uh, I'll, I'll get back to that piece actually, but, so DPW reviewed it, and they recommended that in fact, um, they wondered whether we should pull out those design criteria and just make them into regulations and just simply say in the ordinance that this is how we're going to treat them and you have to get a permit through administrative review following the regulations that would be um, promulgated by Department of Public Works. So that's how we got to here. There was another element of the, the ordinance that had to do with fees and a concern that we were proposing a fee that was too... Um, if it was too onerous and too high for these providers. Um, we've gotten some feedback from what other communities are doing and what recommendations, I guess, from the FCC about what fees are. So now there's sort of two fees being proposed. One is um, we had originally had, um, I think going way back, we had... Um, a much higher fee, and now it's down to $270 in the right of way um, on polls, and that's that was a rec that's the recommended fee, if you can call it a recommendation from the FCC. That basically they're saying that's not an unreasonable fee. Um, we have a thousand dollar fee that's different than was put in for. Um, antenna facilities that would be located on city-owned poles, and that is because it would be, the burden is more on the city um, as it relates to maintenance and making sure that there's care taken and how, you know, the city does maintenance on traffic signals or um, uh, street lamps or any other kind of um, pole that the city owns in the right-of-way. So that's the, diff that's why there's a different fee recommended for those two different scenarios. Thank you. Um, the proponent has spoken. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this point? Opponent? I know Council Murphy. Council Murphy. I, you still get to keep the honorific for what it's worth. So. <laughs> <laughs> I told Councilor uh, Seawall that I was going through withdrawal, so I had to come back for a good dose of it. I saw a public hearing. I'm just sorry. To make myself sorry to hear that that's actually a condition. There is a withdrawal because I don't know. If Absolutely. I can, um, we'll see how much longer you keep seeing me if I get better quickly or not. <laughs> okay, Councilor Kirby. I mean, well, Murphy, I'm sorry. Let's proceed. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. Um, no, I think this is a pretty good example of things that have gotten better. You know, this has been a real grind from the original version. The original version, we were burying these things in the ground at the foot of the pole, which was blatantly ridiculous, but that seems to have gone away. So we're back. The fee has gone down more in conformance is what, what the feds wanted. Um, so that's good. Um, and there seems to be more flexibility. We acknowledge the fact that we're going to probably put some on poles we own, which is a good thing, because uh, that's great. I, this, The overriding reason to try to not make this too prohibitive is that this is going to fundamentally change how we do things. You know, this is going to be competition for cable. This is going to allow all kinds of interesting new opportunities to use the internet positively in, in the world. So being too prohibitive kind of in a knee-jerk way is kind of a bad thing. Um, and these things do, they're low power, they have to be spread out on phone poles, so they cover because they're, they're not long range like the, the other frequencies are. So it's a good, I think this has moved in a positive way. One thing that I still and I've always found vexing, is the fact that it appears that there was another new rendition of this that just appeared, which I find truly unfortunate. In fact, when I was in sitting in your position, sometimes I get, I don't know if this was in your packet or not, but we get here and what we had in our packet was not what was presented to us. 
which makes it very difficult, particularly in a public hearing environment, for people to come to a public hearing and know what you're even talking about if it changes substantially and a draft isn't circulated. You know, it might be easier for you guys if you get one in your packet, but maybe you didn't. We didn't always get them in our packet. They'd show up new the night of the hearing. And for an out member of the public, it's really hard because we got no shot if we don't show up kind of wondering what it's going to be. We never know because it comes at the very, uh, it comes at the 11th hour. Um, so I think this is a better version. I am interested. Uh, you can have this copy here. Oh, no. Just, I mean. I'll, I'll grab it afterwards. Okay. I, you know, I kind of yeah. was trying to listen to it over the people having a party in the hall. Yeah. But um, it has gotten a lot better. So I, I think, you know, I feel a little vindicated for having been the one that primarily made this thing stick around for so long. I'm confident that it got better in the process. Uh, though I'm still a little distressed that major changes don't appear until the 11th hour, so you and we don't have a chance to actually digest them before the meeting. That's still disappointing. But I think, I think this is a better version. I'm also interested, because we talk about DPW having a role in this, but that isn't actually defined. It's like DPW will maybe propagate some rebel, re regulations on their own, again, outside of this venue, so we don't know what they are, what their process is, because they don't have a board anymore. They're a department of the city, so they, they don't have a public process anymore at DPW, I don't think, like you have here. The staff decides what their policy is going to be, and that's what the policy is. So there really isn't a chance of a public hearing or any input. So I really don't, because that kind of just appeared in this one, I really don't know what the implications of that could be, whether bureaucrats could change it in a substantially negative way. You know, we don't know what that is because I really didn't see that coming. So I guess that's my only comment. Uh, it got better. I feel good that the process got dragged out, so I don't feel so bad about doing that and making you guys deal with it when it could have been done last year. It got better, but I'm still sort of vexed by the fact that nobody knows really what you're talking about till you get here because the drafts don't come out early enough. And then the role of DPW in the fact that they don't have a process anymore, they don't have a board anymore. They just decide what they're going to do and that's what they do and it could substantially change what you've done because they'll just change it with, with staff activity. So I guess that's my only comments. Thank you. Thank and, you. And, and thank you all. Thank, thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Um, any other comments from the public on I'll accept a motion to close the public hearing. Second. And any discussion on the close of the public hearing? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 The opposed or abstentions, no. Um, okay. So we get back to the agenda here. Or the internet doesn't kill me. Um, So we also have um, a second. All right. So we've done the public hearings. Um, actually, or we don't have on here the the, 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 deli the deliberation of the items for referral. Well, we do for what for this one. For this one. No, no. It, it, now, we, now that we close the hearing, we can discuss it. And, and, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, anyway, it would. It, it, yeah, we're good. We're good. So, now, um, discussion on this. We uh, we should put it on the floor for discussion. So, is there a motion for purposes of discussion? We have a positive recommendation. Okay. Is there a second for that? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So the motion on the floor. Well, that's that's what I want to oh, talk okay. about. That's what I'm going to discuss. So, actually, that's a good point. Um, we should talk about amendment, and then we can also talk in the process talk about the point that Council Murphy brought up. So, if you would withdraw those motions and then instead. Uh, Make a motion to amend. I would have a motion and move to amend this ordinance. So let's let's uh, Carolyn, if you would come speak to the to the amendments anyway, so we discuss the. Um, I I did point out the amendments as I read them, the modifications from the version that is in our packet. Um, uh, let's start with the one point that Council Murphy actually mentioned 
uh, was the oversight by the DPW um, creating or generating their own rules uh, administratively uh, beyond, uh, beyond public deliberative body. Um. You know, we're, the city is certainly constrained by um, um, what it can do with respect to regulating these right, the facilities. Right, the, the feds are pretty So we're going to be granting permits for these, and, and, and the question is, getting into the nitty gritty detail about the design features and, um, you know, the elements that, um, that we want are, um, you know, DPW could create, the way we've written this is we wanted to sort of be three departments participating in making sure that we're covering the bases for, you know, maintenance in the right of way, but also um, aesthetic considerations, which um, are pretty standard design guidelines that are the and they're out there, I mean, they're product developers that are creating these things. So I don't, uh, given that we have to grant permits for these, I don't know how much, you know, backroom dealing or I'm not understanding what has, what's going to get approved is going to happen. Um, but, you know, I think it's a question, I mean, I think um, Solicitor Seawald also had, you know, questions about, um, about discretionary permits and discretionary language within this, and we've um, stripped that from this to um, so that it, it's not discretionary. And I guess that's where the question comes in: is how much of it is really discretionary? And we feel like we've we've worked to eliminate those elements. You, you've had an opportunity to read the amended this amendment. Yes, I have. I worked with Carolyn today. As Carolyn said, that. Uh, I guess it was last fall, the, the director of planning and I sort of worked through this because he wanted to, he had proposed that he would be the granting authority. <clears throat> and the first draft was, had things like, the vault shall be buried if feasible. Well, I said to him, you, you can't have if feasible in here if you're going to be granting it administratively. What you need is a checklist. You have to fulfill A, B, C, D, and E, and if you do that, you get your permit. Not, you know, if if feasible or if practicable, uh, do this because that's the kind of discretion that needs to be exercised in public. Because uh, as I explained to uh, to Wayne that you know if you were going to have this big wall stuck outside your house, and it was based on a determination that somebody made in their office in the quiet of their office that it wasn't feasible to bury it, well, you haven't given the homeowner the chance to, to say, well, here's my engineer saying it's perfectly feasible. And so uh, what I told Wayne was he had to strip out all discretion. And that's why uh, when uh, Councilor Murphy was talking about burying it, I said, Wayne, you either, they're either on the ground or they're buried. They're not one or the other. You'll decide when you get the application. So you have to fix the criteria and not have discretion. If it's going to be a discretionary permit, it needs to be done by a board in public. So that the, so everyone knows, and I think I'm repeating myself. Everyone knows how that discretion was exercised, and on what basis that discretion was exercised. Uh, so that's the conversation that Wayne and I had throughout this process. Uh, I suggested to Carolyn today that it would probably be more appropriate for the DPW to do this administratively because they issue other administrative per, uh, permits, like trench permits. I don't hold hearings on trench permits. If you comply with their requirements, you get your trench permit. And that's what I'm looking for here. Um, the, the problem with discretionary um, criteria is that on, on co-location, a board would have 60 days to issue a decision. That's the shot clock on these for co-location and 90 days for new polls. We don't operate on those time frames. Um, you know, we have to give you know, 14 days notice before the hearing, and, and we have all these processes uh, and if you're going to exercise discretion, you're going to take evidence. Those are really short timelines, and so that's why we sort of went to the administrative approval. It's worth noting, actually, for those who have not participated in this conversation originally, the FCC is really kind of 
pretty much mandated that there's not a lot of things that we can do providing oversight. We can't resist these, we can't stop them, we can't even require RF transmission levels to be returned, health factors, all of that. Uh, um, another non-elected board, the FCC, has made, has uh, essentially given us this very narrow area by which we may regulate something. It's basically saying these are coming, there's not much you can do about it, you can figure out where you're going to put it on a pole if you want, but that's pretty much it. Um, the amendments actually currently, I do like the language much better. I think it also, I mean, one of the concerns was that we were too narrowly defining what it was that we were regulating and uh, would not be comprehensive coverage of, of the technology that we're facing. The other problem is, of course, it is necessary to create these rules because there are no rules currently. Uh, for any of this stuff, because this is one of those circumstances where the technology far outstrips, as, as the solicitor described, the processes by which we generate rules regulating these things to either protect ourselves or at least improve our circumstances. So that's where we find ourselves, and that's why we're, we've got what we've got, and that's why uh, Council Murphy actually was right. We, 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 we acted in haste, and uh, Council Murphy told us that counseled us to slow down, and Carolyn was in turn worked very hard trying to figure this out and suck this out over time. I actually, I do, I do think this is, the, as Councilor Murphy points out, much improved. Um, Councilor Shara. Um, so the 5G is back in the today's version. Is that inadvertent? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that's, in this amendment, I would move to strike in uh, the Final uh, second of final paragraph uh, for the word now says for the purpose of providing 5G wireless telecommunications, I would strike 5G. Can I ask another follow-up question? So if if the 5G is back in here because it had been a previous version, are there other things that had been amended that we should be looking forward to amend again? I hope not. That's what the only amendment the council. Okay. Right. Yeah. That was it. So that it's more or less a scrivener's error because we've already amended to strike 5G from yeah. this anyway. Oh. Yeah. I just had a question about the languaging of facilities. Um, it looks like you're kind of replacing telecommunications with facilities, but that's so so for 350-10.9, small cell telecommunications, but then you say wireless small cell facilities. Yeah. I just don't know. No, you're right. right. That could be facilities too, just to be the, the head. Yeah. The, to be the head. Yeah. yeah. That would consist. Yeah. Do you see that yeah. bar D under here? Small cell. Um, and I don't know if that. Telecommunications oh, okay. should say facilities. Right. Yeah. The same for 350.2.1, 5G, which, which we took out wireless telecommunications. I don't know if that should be facilities or maybe not in that context. Um. I mean, that could be wireless facilities. Yeah, it's pretty, it's, yeah well, it's, it's for providing tele, uh, wireless telecommunications. You're not providing yeah. facilities. Oh, yeah, right. okay. So, that makes sense. <clears throat> so that it's appropriate there. That's right? appropriate But there. in the head, that's a good change. Okay. All right, so we have th those two essentially scriptures. Uh, all the, let's, let's, so that's a motion, and it was a second on that? Second. Okay. All those in favor of those two amendments to the amendments, please say aye. 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 Now to the greater body of amendments. Uh, are there any other concerns with the proposed amendments? And, and I do, and I, you know, I acknowledge this is horribly unfair to drop you guys right in the middle of this. This is this is drinking from a fire hose, and I do apologize. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, it's true. It is. It's. Uh, Fortunately, Council Murphy did come to testify because he's been following this. So we, we have almost the uh, in, in two other councilors who were part of this body also participate in this conversation. But uh, everyone comfortable with the amendments as they stand? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. So let's. Now I would accept a motion of, with a positive referral, and we're getting down to it. We're past. I see Sarah sitting there waiting for me. So 
Um, is there a motion to send this forward to the council with a positive referral? Move, uh, move a positive referral. Okay. Second. Any second. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. That has been referred. Um, there's. <laughs> Um, let's see. The next item is, of course, an ordinance relative to the demolition review for historically significant buildings. This is referred by the council. We're going to have to postpone this. This is going to. Our next meeting is going to be chock a block with lots of stuff. There's also the ordinance relative to parking on Bridge Street, which uh, Council Nash has actually asked us to take down the road. So, um, and then we have to schedule a public hearing for the Charter Review Committee recommendations. That we have to do now. Sam Moulton is here. We're going to do this in five seconds. Okay. But we would like to, the, what we're, the, why did you need to pull the public hearing? It was requested, actually, uh, by, by the council president so that, um, excellent. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a perfectly excellent reason. I just want to make sure you think you were obligated. No, no, we do, and not out of obligation other than a civic obligation we felt. And just the opportunity to have Stan come back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, point of clarification. Yes. So we, uh, the ordinance of the road to demolition review, we're postponing it because because we can't. Yeah, we don't have. We're done. We're up against it. We're supposed to. We're supposed to. Uh, I didn't know there was time. Uh, yeah, we're to seven. Really? This room's booked. Oh, this is good to know. <laughs> we're stepping on Sarah's meeting here. Yes. Okay. Well, he's here for this ordinance. Actually. Yes. Oh, are you the here for this ordinance? Yeah. Okay. For the oh. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay. All right. Well, since we have you here, Sarah, you're not here for another meeting. You're here for that. All right. Um, item 20.012, this is an ordinance relative to demolition review for historically significant buildings. Um, um, again, I'm going to skip all the gobbledygook, but the building and structures regulated by this chapter are buildings or structures built in formerly 1945, uh, 1939. The proposed change is to change it to 1945 or earlier, determined to be historically significant and preferably preserved by the Northampton Historical Commission. Such regulated buildings or structures and add are all of those and strike will be defined by age for properties built in 1900 and earlier and then also adding and all principal buildings or principal structures parenthetically for example not including outbuilding sheds accessory structures and fences closed parentheses and then we're striking and determined by inventory listing for those buildings be, uh, that struck and then we continue with built between 1901 and now 1945 as opposed to 1939. We also strike the Northampton Historical Commission will create the inventory within a two year period from the date of the adoption of this chapter. The Historical Commission shall make a report to the City Council every six months <coughs> after the date of the adoption of this chapter for the two year period to report on the progress and all reviews will be conducted based on a construction date of 1939 or earlier during the time that the inventory is being developed. That will, that's all being struck. And then we continue with after the initial age and then strike and inventory. So after the initial age based threshold determination, the commission will institute the public hearing process to ascertain if the historically significant and preferably preserved criteria apply and at that time the determination would be made whether or not to activate a review period. Okay, so Sarah. This is Sarah LaValle. She's, you'll, you'll get to know her pretty well, so. Hello, uh, so I staff the Historical Commission among um, other boards and committees in the city. And although this, this ordinance seems like it's pretty complicated, it, it's really pretty simple. All this complicated language and formally applied is coming out and we're now, um, the Historical Commission is looking to have the demo review ordinance apply to uh, every building built in 1945 or earlier, except in outbuildings, so it doesn't become a little bit onerous. 
so some background on the demo delay ordinance. It was adopted in 2005 to protect and preserve significant buildings and structures by identi identifying alternatives to demolition. Uh, so regulated structures, as you just read, under the current ordinance include all of the properties built in 1900 or earlier and a selection of properties built between 1901 and 1939. And this was done as sort of a compromise <coughs> when the ordinance was first passed because no one really knew how it would work or how onerous it would be to property owners. Um, and the way it works is that prior to issuance of a demo permit for any regulated structure, the building inspector forwards the application to the historic commission for review. There's no application cost for demo delay beyond what's, what they're already applying in the building department for. Um, upon receipt of an application, commission members visit sites to evaluate historical significance. Uh, it's done by a subcommittee, so the turnaround time is quick. If the structure is determined not to be significant, a demo permit may be issued, and that's usually done within a couple days. Um, findings of non-significance constitute the majority of review under the ordinance. So there have been 92 total reviews in the 15 years that the ordinance has been in place, and 75% of those were determined not to be significant. So there was no complication for uh, the property owner seeking a permit of any kind. Um, if a structure is determined to be significant, a public hearing is then held. Following a hearing, properties can be determined significant but not preferably preserved. And dem demo can proceed or it can be determined preferably preserved and a demo delay of up to one year is enacted. And that's only happened 10 times. Um, in many cases, demo was allowed to proceed with no delay, but the commission requested that photos be taken of structures for documentation purposes that elements of the structure be saved or that a replacement structure be configured to be a little bit more in line with the historic streetscape. Um, and a couple of reasons for this requested change. Um, local records were destroyed by fire in the early 1900s, resulting in the construction year to often be listed as 1901, which is usually incorrect. If you were just to look at the assessor records, you would think that 60% of the buildings in the were built in 1901. Right. Before, yeah. yes. Um, so by including principal structures built through 1945, the commission will be able to consider the city's potential historic resources a little bit better. It brings it more in line with regional and state consideration of what's considered to be historic without creating additional permitting burdens for residents. And outbuildings built prior to 1901 will still be subject to review as they are currently. Any discussion or questions for Sarah? The, um, and in fact, there seems to be somewhat of a relaxing of, of at least definitions and criteria that um, makes the existence a little more rigid before. I, I, you said there have only been 10 demolition delays yes. issued yeah. since, um, since, 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 since There have been a few more buildings that were determined to be preferably preserved, but working with applicants, the, the commission um, worked out a sort of trade off. Uh, one building was moved. So that was allowed to take place. Um, a few of them were allowed to be demolished with extensive uh, historic documentation. What, a, what about things like eminent domain properties? For instance, the two properties in Budding, uh, Damon Road, that are all boarded up and look like they're doomed. So, so those were um, undertaken by the State Department of Transportation, so they were, that was not subject to them. So not, they're not subject to yeah. huh. That's a surprise. Okay. Um, any other questions or discussion? Um, okay. All those in favor of moving this forward with a positive recommendation to the to the general council. Oh, that's right. I skipped over this whole damn thing. I'm sorry. Is there a motion? Move positive recommendation. Second. Uh, second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of moving this forward with a positive recommendation, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we are kicking uh, the parking on Bridge Street down the road because there's still one pending in transportation parking and Councilor Nash has requested that they be considered together and so ask that we move this to our next meeting. Um, so now we'll come up to scheduling a public hearing for a presentation for the uh, uh, Charter Review, uh, by the Charter Review Committee and co-chair uh, in discussion by the public for, uh, before this is before the council discusses and deliberates and then uh, presumably sends it on to the mayor. So um, 
First of all, Stan, do you have a preferred date? Oh, no, uh, uh, I don't. I mean, uh, I, I have communicated to Councilor Dwight that uh, I'm, I've got a prior commitment on March 9th. It would be difficult for me to get here before 7. Your meetings seem to go um, quite extensive. So, well, so. some do, yes. Yes. But, uh, but in terms of an alternative date, I, I'm generally free, I, and it would be a presentation. Sam's not here tonight, but Sam Hopper and I would, would, would make a presentation summarizing our work and our recommendations. Yeah. Council Shara, is there a date that you would prefer? Uh, I would like to see the date that we agreed on in um, a days that a room is available. Um, so the fourth Tuesday is always reserved for a special finance committee meeting. If oh. there is one, and um, as of yet, I don't know of one, February 25th. Oh, well, we have to have the chair of finance here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, so um, there's that. I'm trying to think of dates that I know that Council Chambers is booked but not being used. Um, let's see. Or you want to go? For, you want to go between now and March 9th? Is that yeah, right? that's the hope. Yeah. Yes. So and actually, there's never the fourth Monday. I know, I know there's no standing city council subcommittee that has a meeting that I'm no, not so sure. This is not. I can wonder. I can almost look on the calendar to see. Uh, that would be the 24th. Yeah, the Monday the 24th. Oh, well, uh, there's an override forum that I can I board, uh, but that's not till seven. So possibly. well, this this will probably be at seven as well. Oh. So yeah. I mean, it's not signed into. I mean, it'll have to be the right. Well, yeah. So it's module that I can look at the access to my calendar. You don't need to be your partner. Okay. I don't know. I don't think I need to. I certainly will if you want me to. I don't see any reason that the solicitor should be here for that meeting. Do you understand? Uh, well, I always enjoy the solicitor. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the question. That's what he was cruising for. That's <laughs> um, I, I, you know, we, you know, we heard from him throughout. So I, I don't, I don't think for the hearing he necessarily needs to be here. Right. Um, right. Second. The second. There's city services, but that's at four. Monday the 2nd, 7 o'clock, this room. Monday, that's right. That works for me. JT? Is that what you I'm sorry, 4, no, okay. 7. 7 o'clock, so yeah. it'll be, it will go city services at 4. Right. Okay. It'll be here already. Yeah. Let's <laughs> go. Stan, does that work for you? Yes, Monday, March 2nd, 7 p.m. I'll make sure that Sam's aware of the date. Let JT check oh, his good. calendar. Oh. It looks good? Yeah. All right, all those in favor of actually, there wasn't a motion, but I mean, basically we're going to take a straw vote. All those in favor of having the special meeting at 7 p.m. on March 2nd in these chambers. Say aye. 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 All right. Please, uh, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Aye. Thank you all very much.